Okay, so uh, let's uh, get started. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you read my last email that I sent you. This is being recorded, uh, and uh, so this will again be available uh, later on um, when we finish this, obviously. Uh, and I did ask everyone uh, if they can to prepare questions that they may have uh, from last week's uh, uh, session that we had. So I am open now. Let's first start off. I'm open to questions and we could deal with that as well. Okay. Does anybody have questions? Okay, I guess not for now. Okay. Um, all right, so what I'd like to do today, first of all, I want you to pay attention to the screen right now. I have our site over here. And uh, you'll note uh, that uh, I want everyone also on their time when they can to look under this tab here called iMachining, okay? Uh, we will also talk a little bit today about iMachining, but there's a lot of information about what iMachining does, its benefits, the technology wizard. Basically, there's a lot of information that will be very, very helpful to you uh, knowing more about iMachining itself. Uh, this is a extremely powerful uh, tool that we have inside of SolidCam, and uh, it is definitely it will be helpful with your tools as well uh which is one of the major issues over here and uh so i'd like to get everyone to get as mo as familiar as i can with i machining as well okay now uh what i'd like to do basically in this session uh since there are no questions yet or people haven't uh had a chance to look uh, go over it to look for questions uh i'd like to do two things one i'd like to um program a part again quickly and then I'd like to talk about uh, also I machining and I'd also like to talk a little bit about the issues such as um, uh, what happens if there are changes in the part and how quickly you can actually update uh, some of your operations okay so let me go back to the program and I'm going to go back to the part that we used last time, okay? Um, if I remember correctly, it was this part over here. Okay. Okay, I see that everybody sees this part. And just a moment, let it finish loading, okay. Uh, let me delete what I've done here before. I was uh, playing around with it, just, just just experimenting to show you some of the features that we have here. And let me just redo my stock because I know I made changes in my stock. I'll define my stock quickly by using what we call the box and clicking on the part, creating a box around the part with the excess material as shown over here okay now one of the ways to create operations quickly okay is use something and i touched upon this a little bit last week but i want to go a little further into it now what we call templates or drag and drop templates now you'll note that on the right hand of my screen, we have what we call drag and drop templates. We have our tabs over here for SolidCam, and we also have a tab here for the drag and drop templates. Now I wanna talk specifically about the operation templates. You'll note that we can have all our operation templates over here. Uh, my, actually, my entire list of operation templates are much bigger than we have. I have a lot more templates over here. If I were to right-click on any one of them, I can customize my list and just say check all and show all of my templates. 
and you can see I have all of the templates for all the different types of operations. Okay. But as you see also, there are so many over here and there may be times where I don't really need to see all of them. So I can just right click over here. This is also helpful for when you do demonstrations. I can go to customize and I say, okay, I only want to see maybe the pocket operation. Uh, I want to see the chamfer recognition over here, my drilling operation. No, I don't even want to see that. I want to see my face. Uh, these, I don't want to see that, those. I only want to see a specific amount. Let's see my 3D eye machining, eye machining, pocket recognition profile. These I don't want to see. I'm just going to leave it exactly like this. I only wanted to see these operations over here. And you see how quickly I can basically cut down my list so it makes it a lot easier to navigate. This will also help you out when you're doing your demonstrations. Now, um, if you also want to reorder these templates, again, when I go to customize, you can see I can uh, click on one, for example, my face over here, face mill, and I can say just move it up. So I can move it up to the top. And I can have whatever ever order I want over here. And you can see now my face is on top. Okay. So how would I start off an opera, uh, a demonstration? Created my, uh, my part over here. Okay. And I'll go to my face templates. And you can see I have different face templates over here. I'm just going to take it and drag it to the part itself. Doing that. I automatically create an operation. Your operation is done. You already have a tool pass. Okay. I want to create another operation, say, to work on this area. Okay. I'm going to create what we call an eye machining operation. And I'm going to get into eye machining very, very shortly because eye machining is a very, very important part uh, when using when working with eye machine with, uh, with working with solid cam. Okay. I'd like to first, before I actually uh, mill the outside, this part over here, this pocket over here, which goes all around, I'd like to first do the outside of the part, okay? I have an operation here in eye machining, which I call outside, okay? I'm just going to drag that to the part, and you'll know what's going to happen now. It's going to create my operation milling the outside of the part okay i can even run a quick go to my operations and run a quick simulation using solid verify and if i run it my first operation you can see my face mill and my second operation you can see the outside being milled out okay i can continue now i'm going to say okay i want to work on this area over here so i'm going to take a um uh, eye rough and eye finish for this surface over here drag it onto it and you can see now that my tool pass is being created for that particular surface you can see that over here now as well now i can do the same thing Let's say I want to continue on these surfaces over here. Now, these surfaces, you'll note, I have one, two, three. I have all of them on the same level. I want to do them all in one operation. So to do that, I'm just going to take the, the um, sorry, I'm going to take the operation. Here we go, this one. I'm going to drag it to the surface, but I'm going to hold my control button. And as long as I hold my control button, it doesn't start calculating the operation. Or creating the operation until I let go of my control button. Now that I let it go, it's creating the operation and it does it for all of those surfaces on top over there. Now, besides templates, okay, Let's say I don't have templates for whatever reason, which I always advise in any case, you should have templates. But let's say you don't have templates. Okay. Um, so I'll answer the question about, uh, about the question asked about templates in a moment. 
Let's say I don't have templates or I didn't create templates. And I just created a regular operation, which I will have over here. Now I want to take that exact operation and also have it for that surface over there, a different operation and have it for that area over there. I can take the operation itself, drag it to that surface without having templates, and it will create the operation on that pocket as well, as you see over there. So I don't necessarily need a template. I can also do it from the regular operations. Now, a question was asked before about these templates. Are these templates something that I created? The answer is yes. Okay. How do I create a template? Okay. I don't remember if I touched upon this last week, but just in case, I'll show it again. Okay. If I were to open up any operation, okay, and um, I'm going to show right now in iMachining, but I want to talk a little bit more about iMachining afterwards also. So I'm just going to run through it for now, and I'm going to actually delete this operation over that I have over here. Delete. Okay. If I go to my iMachining operation, iMachining 2D, okay, I'm going to choose the option of say I rough and I finish. Then I want to do finish and rough at the same time with the same tool, okay? And I want to work on this surface over here. I'm going to click this area over here, click on that surface. I'm going to uh, choose a tool that I may have. I can either choose one from my existing tool table, which I have, which is about to open over here, or I can create a new tool. I'm just going to use an end mill that I have over here. Say uh, I have an eight millimeter end mill. I'm going to use that one over here. Okay. I'm not going to touch my levels now. I'm going to leave everything exactly the way it is. Now, how do I create a template? Everything over here that I want is fine. And again, I said, as I said before, I'll talk about iMachining a little later on. How do I create a template? Simple. You note on top, we have here something called template. If I click on save template, it's going to save it to my template table. And let's call this I finish, uh, I rough, I finish. And I'm going to call this uh, with the uh, class. And I'm going to even add something like um, uh, eight millimeters, eight millimeters, something that's going to tell me something about the tool. Now, pay attention what's going to happen to over here the moment I click on OK. The moment I click on OK, that template has been created. Now I have a template. So let's say I'm, I'm going to go out of the operation without saving it. This template now is available for wherever I want to use it. Okay, so I can take this template and let's say drag it to this surface here. It's going to create the operation over there. I can take that same template, okay, and drag it to here. I'm going to hold my control button and put it over here as well. And there I have my operation for those two pockets itself. So you so you what you're seeing over here now is very simple. Without having to go and create the operation, saving an operation in the template allows you to create operations quickly and the oper the technology in the operation is exactly the way you want it, okay? Now, even though I'm using a template and I using I have a specific um uh technology that I've used in it that doesn't mean I'm locked in the way it was used. I can always go back to any of these operations I created with the template and I can always edit the operation itself. Okay? Right click edit or double click on the operation itself edit and I can go back into the operation 
and do any kind of editing over here, whether it be to my technology wizard, which we'll talk about shortly, uh, the actual technology, offsets, all of these things uh, can be edited over here. And it does not affect the template, okay? It's just affecting this specific operation. The template itself stays exactly the way it was before. If I wanna update the template, I can always still save and save it under the same name and it'll obviously replace the template that was there before. Okay, so that is about drag and drop, temp uh, drag and drop templates. Now, uh, there's also a little more involved over here also. There's a lot more automation I'd like to show you as well. And after that, I'm going to go into uh, the um, something what we call whole wizard. And then I will talk about iMachining itself. Okay. Now, let's say I completely did this whole part. Okay. I finished the part. Uh, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to delete all of my operations. And I want to break edges on all the sharp edges that are here. Okay, I'm going to put a little chamfer on the edges because the uh, blueprint I may have says break all edges by 0.2 millimeters. Okay. To demonstrate this correctly, I have to have a finished part here. How do I quickly get a finished part? A finished part is if I have my stock exactly the way my target is. If I were to go and open up my stock to define it, right now you'll note that I defined it by a box. If I go over here, I can also open this and say, let's define a 3D model as my stock. And what's my 3D model going to be? The actual part. So if I look at my stock itself by clicking on show, you'll see that's my stock. So my stock and my target are the exact same thing now. So if I wanna show my next option, it'll show it very, very well. Let's see what I wanna show now. We have here something in our, in our um, program called chamfer recognition, okay? If I were to click on chamfer recognition, my geometry, if I click on this, create my geometry, will be the actual part itself. I can also limit that it should not recognize any holes smaller than a certain diameter. Okay, I'm just gonna leave it exactly the way it is now. I'm just going to click in the part. What you see now, it's recognizing every single face on the part itself, and everything is automatically picked up. Okay, I'm going to say use 3D model protection to protect my model itself, making sure maybe the side of the tool doesn't get too close to the edge over here. I'm going to say, let's keep it away by 0.1 millimeters. Now my tool, I'm going to choose a chamfer mill, okay? So I have a chamfer mill ready in my tool table, if I remember correctly. Here I have one over here, a three millimeter chamfer mill tool, it's 90 degrees. In my levels, what's important over here at this point is my chamfer depth, okay? I want to have a 0.2 millimeter chamfer. In my technology, I can always say, what's the diameter of the tool that I wanna work with? Note the picture over here. You'll see what's the diameter of the tool that I actually wanna work with, with over here on the, on, the, on the creative chamfer, okay? I'm just going to do save and calculate. And let's take a look at what the results are over here. We'll run my simulation, I'll use it with solid verify. Okay, and what's actually happening, it picks up every single edge that's over here and creates, uh, creates the broken edge needed. Now, if we take a look towards this edge over here, you'll note that the tool 
the chamfer mill went as close as possible as it can to the edge over here without gouging this area over here as well. Now, remember what I said before about drag and drop operations? What if I save this as a template? I'm going to delete this. And I'm going to minimize everything to make it easier to view what I'm looking for. And I see, here we go, chamfer recognition. I'm going to take this chamfer recognition a template that I created and just drag it to the part. Now, you saw how much work I did inside the operation before. Basically, I just did it now with one click by using a template. Okay, so templates are extremely helpful when you want to get something done quickly. Okay, by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Everyone can, un whoever wants to ask a question, you don't have to write it down. You can ask me uh, straight offhand. Uh, just unmute yourself. Okay. And again, for everyone who came late, reminding you that um, this is being recorded. Uh, so you can always catch up a little later on as well. Okay. I'd like to choose now a different part. And in this part, let me go to my browse over here so I can get my open part, a part that looks like this. Now, what I'd like to show in this part is something very simple. All of these holes that you see in this part, whether it be the counter bore hole, the uh, tapped holes, the counter sunk holes, uh, the uh, plain holes over here that may be over here, all of them were created in SolidWorks using the whole wizard of SolidWorks. Okay. Now, being that was done with the whole wizard of SolidWorks, we have something called whole wizard process. I think I touched upon, upon this last week, but I want to go a little more in depth in it. I want to create the operations for all of these holes over here, okay? You'll note that we have a whole wizard process as far as drag and drop as well. We have drag to hole. Drag to hole would do it only for one type of hole or that group of holes. And we also have drag to surface. When I do drag to surface, I can drag it to any one of these flat surfaces that I have over there, any one of them. It is now uh, doing a recognition of every single one of those holes on the part. And right now I'm just sitting back, relaxing for a moment. And look what's happening on my cam tree at the left-hand corner. You'll see all of the operations for all of the holes are being created whether it be the counter board with five operations for each counter board, the tapped holes, counter sunk holes, all of the holes are being created with the proper tool as well. Okay? Now, this is done because we recognize the feature that's inside, that was created inside SolidWorks itself, the whole wizard feature in SolidWorks. And accordingly, we know exactly what type of operation is needed to create those particular operations. Now, I'm going to delete everything. The reason why I'm going to delete everything, I wanna show one particular uh, feature in this. Right now, I'm going to do drag the hole, I'm going to do to one specific hole, okay, one specific set of holes. I'm going to drag it to this counter bore hole over here, okay? Note, it's taking it, what was created in the wizard with its patterns, and it's creating all the operations for that hole. And you notice the counter bore hole that has five different operations over here. Let me do a quick simulation. And we'll do it in solid verify. You can see that all of the operations are being created 
for that particular hole, for those particular set of holes. Okay, excellent. Now, as we all know, when someone usually designs a part, almost always, there's always a revision. Okay, now let's say I'm going to uh, get rid of those over there. Uh, I'm going to open up this part uh, just by clicking on the part and say, open up the part. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this holes over here. Okay. You can see it's a counter bore hole. And I'm going to actually edit it. And they decided that instead of having a counter bore hole here, they want to create a tapped hole instead. So then I'm going to go into SolidWorks, go straight to the tapped hole. I'm going to say I want a tapped hole that is, uh, let's say, M M10. Here we go. M10 by 0 0.5. Going to accept that. You can see the holes were changed. I'm going to go out of here, obviously saving it. And I want you to note what's happening here now. First of all, just a moment. Okay, what's happening over here right now, the part is being screened, and it sees that there are changes on the screen on the part itself. Okay, and you'll note there are little traffic lights by each one of them. If I go to the very top over here, right click, and just do what they call synchronize, okay, look what's going to happen now. It's going to synchronize all my operations, and instead of three, op four, op five operations that I had before, it changed the tools and the operations so that it works now for the tapped holes instead. This is extremely powerful, especially when you, instead of creating new operations or new geometries, it took everything and made new operations for those type of holes. This is a very powerful tool, by the way. And um, whoever's using Hole Wizard, and most people do use Hole Wizard when they're doing uh, SolidWorks parts, uh, this will help them a lot as far as when they make changes. And there's always, almost always, revisions in the part. Okay. Are there any questions up until now? Okay. Let's continue. I'd like to go back to my uh, part that I had before because I'd like to talk a little bit more about... Um, the eye machine, eye machining that we have in the program, and this is especially important uh, for tool manufacturers because it helps their tools actually look better and last longer, uh, which is always very important to the act to the manufacturers to the uh, customer as well. And this is something that should be uh, actually pushed very hard. I'm going to actually open up the previous part that I had before. Now, and again, for everyone who came late, uh, I'd like everyone to also, on their free time, to go onto our website and look at the tab of iMachining, and you can learn everything that you need to know about iMachining. Okay, I'm just going to explain it briefly as far as the signs behind it. I'm going to get rid of this operation over here as well. Delete, and I'm going to change my stock back to what it was originally. I'm going to create it as, as a box. Click on the part. We have a box around the part uh, with two millimeters on X, Y, 
and Z, I have one millimeter on the X plus direction and X is at the bottom of six millimeters. That's my stock. Okay. Now, we have here something called eye machining. And now what, what eye machining does, it takes, it puts actually more science into your cutting. Now, one of the problems that always, we always had with, uh, with tools um, is very simple. If, let's say I would be cutting out, let's say this pocket over here, or cutting any pocket area over here. Uh, and especially with harder material, the problem always was that in order to cut into these areas, normally you'd have to cut using uh, the full diameter of the tools in many cases. Doing so, okay, doing so, uh, you can only go at a certain speed. You can't go full speed ahead. And you also can only usually use a certain depth of the tool. So say I had a, a, a 12 millimeter end mill, that my cutting length on that end mill was 25 millimeters. But every single time I go down into the pocket, I'm only going to a depth of say six millimeters. That means I'm always only using six millimeters of the tip of that tool. Everything above that is barely being used. So the problem is at the end of the day, your tool gets worn out at the first six millimeters of it. And the rest of the tool is perfect, but you're wasting that whole tool and you can't really can't use it anymore. You have to use it in specific ways. Maybe you can cut it down and regrind it. Uh, maybe you can, uh, uh, if it's using for outside operations, maybe you can go deeper instead and use that again. It's in a whole different way, but you weren't getting the most out of your tools. Okay. Also, if we look at the tools itself, and now we want you also to read more about eye machining inside. Um, inside uh, the uh, our site itself whenever you go cut with a tool and you cut with more than more than let's say 85 degrees say even close to 90 degrees of the tool cutting edge what's going to happen is that you're going to have a negative force on the tool from the other side and that's not good for the tool also what happens many times sometimes if you get into a corner Okay, and the tool is just the same size as the radius itself or bigger or very close to the radius itself. When you get to that tool, to that corner over there, and it makes a sharp turn, you'll almost always have vibrations. And one of the things that are worst things for the tool is vibrations, because vibrations are actually what breaks the tool apart. So what eye machining basically does, it controls the engagement angle of the tool and it'll, and it also gives you the feed rate is constantly changing so no matter what engagement angle you are at that time you will always get the exact same chip load on the tooth itself thereby we a, a, a good controlled chip uh to um chip load you can also use for, first of all the entire length of the tool if necessary. Also, your feed rate can be a lot quicker because you're always controlling the load on the tool. Let's take a look at exactly how this works. There are two things that have to be done initially before you start the, the, uh, the, um, the process, the operations. First of all, if I go to my cam part, there are two things that have to be defined. One, is your machine database, and two, the material that you're working on, okay? Because the material that you're working on, your your feed rate is not and spin rate is not going to be the same from between 1020 and say titanium, okay? So putting the um, material database in there, the proper material is essential, okay? Now, I'll talk about the type of machining database, what we're exactly we're doing over here a little later on. 
I'm using something what they call global machines, which is actually set that you can work on any type of, mach any type of machine that you may have set up and it'll automatically adjust itself to the, uh, to the um, dynamics of that particular machine. What do I mean by dynamics? It adjusts itself to the maximum feed and spin rate of that machine, to the horsepower of that machine also. It takes that into account as well. Okay, so let's actually go into iMachining and see what we have over there. If I go into iMachining, We have several ways of creating operations, okay? One, we have, we can choose different faces. So if I were to, for example, click, this is actually the default. You note this is highlighted, this area. So if I were to click, say, on this face over here, okay? And let's just do that face for now, okay? It's going to work on that face only, and it's also going to take into account the updated stock that may be on the part itself, according to the actual stock, taking that into account. And it'll also make sure that it doesn't touch any target or fixture. The target being the model itself doesn't gouge it in any place, and also that will not touch any fit part of the fixtures in any place, if there was a fixture of defined here. Okay. Next, I'd like to choose a tool. Okay. Now, there are several ways of working with it. We have what they call, I can, in one operation, I can define several tools. But just to show this correctly, I'm going to do this right now, just for roughing. Okay. So we can see a little more what's actually going on over here. Okay. The tool. I'll select the tool. Now I'm going to, I'm, I'm purpose, I want to create a tool. So I'm going to, I can use a tool from here, but I want to create one to show you exactly what I need to do. I'm going to choose an end mill. Say I'm going to choose a 10 millimeter end mill. Okay. My diameters, 10 millimeters all along. Um, the shoulder length, very important. My shoulder length, let's say for this particular tool, is say 21 millimeters. And the number of flutes on the tool. The number of flutes, say it has only has four flutes on the tool. And one more piece of information. I'm going to go to eye data. Okay. Uh, cutting length cannot be greater. I'm sorry. They're right. My cutting, sorry, I did the shoulder length. My mistake. I put that back at 30. My cutting length, that's what I should have been talking about, 21 millimeters. Sorry, 21 millimeters. Okay. If I go to my eye data, you'll know I'm working with a carbide tool. They're also asking for the helix angle of the tool. Okay. The helix angle of the tool is important so that we know the actual cutting point where it's actually how. Uh, what's the actual sort of pitch between the cutting points of the tool itself. I'm going to leave it at 45 degrees. And I'm going to accept this tool. Okay. First of all, it shows you what's going to be cut. Okay. And it recognizes the actual area to be cut because we're talking about, if I remember I told you about this, the stock, it looks at the actual stock, what has to be cut. It's also cutting only the only the material that's there. Okay. I'm going to go to my levels, and you'll note that my upper level is automatically recognized according to the actual stock that I have over there. And you'll see the actual stock. I didn't do a face mill operation, so it's actually one millimeter above the part itself. The depth is automatically taken from the face that I touched over here. Now let's go to my technology wizard. And this is where the uh, brains actually is. Okay. You'll note that my technology wizard, it's telling me, okay, it's going to do this with one step. Okay. It sees that it's capable of going down in one step. It's going to do it in one step. 
You can also see the spin rate and the feed rate. It'll show you what my minimum and maximum step over is. And if I look at view two, it'll also show you these values over here. It'll show you what the chip thickness is. That is what's actually going to control your chip load. Okay? That is, we try to keep that chip thickness all the time. Okay. It'll show you also what my maximum cutting angle and my minimum cutting angle of the tool is itself. Now, you'll note one more important thing over here. There's something here called machining level. Now, we can know everything we have to know about the tool, about the machine, about the material. There's one thing we could never know, and you could never know. Only The only person who knows this is the actual machinist or the person doing the setup or the programmer himself. How are you holding the part? Are you holding this part firmly in, your, in, a, in, a, in a really good uh, uh, holding device, a good chuck? of a good vice itself, or are you holding it in a sort of loose type of fixture, which isn't exactly the strongest way? Is your machine, is your machine an old machine or a new machine? Just because your feed rates may be close to what a, a new machine has, doesn't mean that it doesn't have, it may have a little more play in it, okay? So it may not be as strong as the, as the other machine itself. So these are things that we don't know, but the machinist knows. So we give the machinist the opportunity over here to decide what is the level of aggressiveness that he wants to work on the part itself. I have it set at six. I want you to take a note. I'm going to go back to view one over here. And I want you to take a note what happens to these numbers when I start moving it down. Okay, when I start moving it down, you see that my speed rate, spin rate and feed rates change. My feed rates change in accordance to the aggressiveness that I want to work in over here. Okay, that's an important factor. This is what gives the machinist, he can fine tune exactly the way he want to, wants to work. Now, if you ask me, uh, how should he start? If the person doesn't know how it's going to react the first time, I'd always say, you know what, let's start with three. And then he runs the program and he says, he listens. He listens to the machine. He can hear automatically or immediately if the machines will know. He will hear any kind of vibrations or anything else. If it sounds really, really smooth as if nothing is actually happening, then he can start moving it up. Eventually what's going to happen is that the machinist will see already, he'll know in advance already, okay, this is the one that I want to work with. And this is, he'll actually learn what's the best way to work. Now, I talked a lot over here, by the way, during this time over here, but notice what I didn't do. I didn't really do too much work here. All I did was pick my geometry. I picked the tool. The levels, I didn't even pick that. It came in automatically. My technology wizard, I just explained what was here. Okay? In the technology, I'm not even going to do anything in the technology because I'm keeping it at a default rough cut over here. Okay? I'm just going to do save and calculate. Okay, right now it's calculating the tool pass, and you can see the tool pass has been created. Now let's take a look at the actual simulation because there's certain things that now I want to point out to you. Let's take a top view of the part. I'm going to show this my regular cam, uh, regular simulation, but with a sort of solid verifies I can actually see the stock. Let's do this one step at a time. Okay, you can see, let me get rid of these lines here. You can see my tool over here, my end mill, and you can see how it's slowly going in the part. Now, note how it actually is going always in in an arc. It never goes directly in, because go directly in, you're already cutting with a negative rake angle over here. So it's always going to be cutting in this way. And note the also the actual engagement angle of the part. You have from here to here, you have that engagement angle. And you also know, I'm going to play this slowly so you can see this very well. 
you can see how the engagement angle is constantly changing as it's cutting. Note also my feed, my, my feed rate is also automatically changing as it's cutting. So you can always get that constant chip load on the part. Having a constant chip load will always make it so that you won't get vibrations on the tool. That's what prevents the vibration. Now you'll note also that when it finishes cutting, it does, in this particular case, it did a trochoidal cut inside over here. You'll see that as well over here in a minute. Okay. When it goes out of the part and repositions itself, it actually goes up a little bit on the Z. You'll see that over here. Quickly goes to the next area and then again curves into the part. Now, if this was a closed pocket, instead of entering from the outside or everything on the all of the sides were out, it would actually do what we call a morphed spiral cut. Okay, so what we call what we see here actually happening is that it is doing the most efficient cut. It looks like it's taking over a small part, but it's really moving fast. And you compare the the actual time of cutting. We've noted cases where, in many cases, you're saving, especially in harder materials, where it saves you about 70% of your cutting time over here. Let me speed this up now so you can see exactly what's, what's the end result over here. And you'll see a cut wherever it wants to, wherever it needs to, not wherever it wants, wherever it needs to cut. Now, let's take a look again at the actual tool path. You can see we have the trochordial tool path over here. What would happen, remember I showed you before the drag and drop of the operation? What would happen if I were to take this operation now? I'm going to drag it, sorry, I'm going to drag it to this surface over here. You'll note the tool path here is a little different. You know, in the beginning, it actually starts off with a, it's not an exact spiral, it's what we call a morph spiral, where it actually changes its uh, shape as it gets towards the outside. And then when it gets towards the corners, it'll always have, it'll never have a sharp turn in the corners itself. It'll always have that, um, that tricordial or uh, arc movement in there. So you can, you'll never get a, um, what we call vibration on the part itself. Okay, now, how would I finish this? Let's go back in here, into the operation itself. Please. Go ahead, somebody wants to talk. Sorry? Someone, somebody wants to talk? Yeah, it's Yossi, I just want to ask him. Yes, my name is Yossi, and I want to ask you, please, how did you copy uh, this, the eye machining operation from the upper surface to this pocket? How you did it actually on the cam, please? Okay, exactly. Let me let me delete the operation. I'll show you exactly what I did. Delete. Okay, this is the operation that I created. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. If I go to my cam tree, I can drag it. Sorry, drag it by holding my mouse down, okay? Drag it to that surface. Yeah, yeah. And it automatically creates a new operation for that surface with all of the pocket. technology that I've used for that Amazing. previous operation. Okay, this, by the way, Amazing. is very, Thank very you very much. powerful. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. So what's nice about it, because the, the way we, they used to be done is I used to go into the operation over here. I'm just going to show you, I'm gonna show you what I did over here. I want to continue working. The way we used to do this is if I were to go into the operation itself, we have here something called, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, save and copy, which we still have. I'm going to use it now anyway. Save and copy, where it creates a new operation. Okay, for some reason that became 
And in that new operation, I'd make any change, it'd create a new geometry and so on and so forth. And then do save and calculate again, okay? Now, let me just do calculate on this operation here. You want to let before, I just noticed something. And what I like to do now in this new operation that I copied is simple. Uh, I'd like to do now a finish operation. Okay, so I have all of the information that I had before my geometry. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change this now to finish. I finish. I'm going to choose a smaller end mill. Let's say I'm going to choose an end mill. Um, let me see. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Ivan is speaking. Um... On the closed pocket, uh, which is the radius that uh, there is? Okay, the closed pocket. Yes, the last one, this one. one over the there. radius is? Yes, it's a five millimeter radius. Okay. Okay, so and I- And we have 0 0.3 millimeter, millimeter of stock. Radius, even though I use a 10 millimeter end mill, which in itself is a five millimeter radius, you'll note it prevented itself from making a sharp turn in that corner. It doesn't make a sharp, turn it actually can make we prevent it from making those drop turns it always creates a little radius of a little curl of a, of a tool pass so that prevents the vibration that you always had over there okay. so if i have a, a radius uh, uh, five millimeter it's not a problem if i use uh, uh 10 millimeters and mil uh, it will not be good in eye machining to finish it and, and to, to do that way. It won't be good. Why? Because magic, if, if you, th what's going to happen, and this is what happens in every single machine. When you go and machine that corner, especially in a rough cutting, and you make that sharp turn in order to create that uh, corner over there, you're going to have vibration on the tool yes yes no okay that's clear that's good i uh i was thinking that uh, is able to handle i don't know the last pass is close to the to the corner in a different way but okay in any case it's better as always uh, use a smaller diameter right so but 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 let's say i have a big pocket okay now i'm not going to take let's say i have a pocket that's 200 millimeters by 400 millimeters and all my corners are five millimeter radiuses am i going to use a Four mil, uh, eight millimeter end mill to do the entire packet? No, why? Because the boss is going to fire me if I do that. Okay, so, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it doesn't make sense to do. You're always going to use a bigger end mill, and then finish it with a smaller okay. end mill. Okay. Okay, but the, the roughing the, the roughing operation now leave uh, a radius uh, of and which left, size? Left, left, uh, left excess material on this area over here, as well as around the walls. Okay. okay, so let's 0. see 3. how the finish works. Okay, you'll okay. understand this maybe a little better once I do the finish. I'm doing what they call a finishing end mill. I'm going to use the eight millimeter end mill just to show exactly what happens in those corners. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, now I'm not going to make any more changes. I'm going to leave my levels exactly where it is. My technology wizard, I'm going to leave it exactly the way it is. And my technology you'll note that it's working uh, on a finish, okay? Okay, now, it also knows, by the way, to recognize what material was already removed. So only work in those areas where there is material. Okay, so um, I'm going to do save and calculate. Okay, let me get rid of all of these marks over here. I just want to show this one over here. And well, let's see what actually happens over here. First of all, the floor itself was not finished yet, right? So we did a finish pass on the floor, correct? Of course. Now. Yes. Okay, now, so let's do now a simulation. And I want to get to the point where it starts working on the walls itself. Right now you can see it's working going down to the floor itself. Actually, there's something wrong over here. Something bothers me over here. Okay, I think I know what the problem is. 
let me do the simulation over here. A little bit of a glitch over here. Simulate these two operations. My first operation, uh, the solid verify operation, is do this this way. Machine that area over here. My second operation, let me start it off over here. Okay, I have a little bit of a glitch in the program. Just a moment. Let me delete this operation that I did over here. I'm going to just create a new operation. I'm working my way in a little bit of a development uh, uh, program, so sometimes I have a little glitches. Okay, I'm going to choose that uh, floor over there. I'm going to choose my rest, uh, sorry, my finished. I'll choose my tool, my eight millimeter end mill. I believe it's that one over there. Okay, there's a little bit of a glitch in the program. I'm going to do it a little bit different. Uh, remember in the beginning, I always said also there's an option over here called, sorry, there we go, edit. Something called multi-tool. Where in one operation I can create, um, I can use different tools, more than one tool, okay? So I'm ch my first tool was the uh, was the 10 millimeter end mill, and I'm going to select over here immediately my second tool uh, to be this end mill over here, the eight millimeter end mill. And for this one, I'm going to tell it over here to do a finish, hold on a second, on the wall. I'm not going to finish the floor. I'm just going to do a finish on the wall itself. You know, let's do the floor also. Why not? Okay. I'm just going to do now save and calculate. You're going to see now we're going to have two operations here. The first one being my uh, rough and the second one being the finish. This is I can do this all in one operation as well. Okay. Let's take a look now at the simulation of the second operation. Okay. First of all, you can see the second operation, what's happening. It first did the floor. Okay. And now when it gets to the corners, and I actually want to run the simulation, let's do run the simulation. Over here, let me do it a little slowly. Eh, come on. I was doing the simulation for all the operations. My mistake. I'm going to stop it. Okay. First operation. Okay, now we're going to start with the second operation. Uh, I'm supposed to do everything over here. We'll do both of these. My mistake. Okay, again, the first one. And now we're going to start with the second one. You'll note what's happening now. It's going down towards the corner. It's going to first tricordial into the corner itself until it gets close to the finish. Okay, because we still have excess material, a lot of excess material in that corner. It's going to do that for all the corners. Let me actually do this slowly over here. Let it run. Okay, now what's going to happen when it finishes the corners? It's going to do a finish pass on the floor, and then one pass, hold on a second, it's going to do that in a minute, on the corners itself, on the entire wall. Notice it finishes the corners, the floor, and then it does a finish pass on the entire wall. Okay, so what actually happened over here, for the finish, it allowed to, for the exact amount of material to be removed all around. So with the corners, with the, make sure there's no not too much excess material in the corner itself, and then finishes off the corners as well. And this tool can take those corners because it's smaller than the uh, it's, it's smaller than the uh, actual corner over there. Okay, uh, you may be asking why this over here is still showing as uncut because 
this is material that I didn't cut yet from beforehand. I just skipped that part for now. Now, there was a question asked before. Uh, let me see. Somebody just in the chat box asked the question. Can you simulate again the last tool? Sure, no problem. Let me go out of the operation itself. Maybe it'd be easier this way. I'm just going to click over here, run my simulation from this part, point over here. And remember now, I gave everyone the parts, so you can always practice on the parts that you have. Okay. All right, let's end this for now. Uh, I think we're going to have, with me, we're going to have one more session next week. Um, and um, what we, if necessary, we'll actually see exactly what the next session is going to be. Again, please, uh, if you can, if you have questions, it'll be a perfect time. Gather questions. Read also a little bit more about iMachining on our website. Go to our website under iMachining. There's a lot over here to learn about iMachining, uh, exactly what it does. You'll get a lot more, a clear picture of what this does. This is extremely important, especially for you guys. This is something that will definitely help you uh, with your tools, with, um, uh, with demonstrating the program. It, it actually shows um the strength of the tool of the of the program itself with we, we, we're using i machining uh i do remember also a lot of times when i machining first came out uh in solid cam um i remember there were customers that would talk to me and they asked me well, what exactly is i machining and i started explaining to them and i said you know what what are you doing right now on your machine they told me they're doing this kind of part of specific pockets you know what I'm going to drop by you tomorrow. I'm, I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to show it to you. And what I did was I actually went there to the program. I went into the program, and they showed me what they did. They said, okay, let's replace it with exactly what you did with the iMachining with your tool that you just used. And I remember when the first time I did it, uh, and I gave them a really, and they thought I was crazy with the kind of feed rate that, that they were going to be getting. And they all stood back. And all of a sudden, after it started cutting, they all of a sudden start coming closer and looking, wow, do that again, please. <laughs> because it cut so quickly, and the chip came out so beautiful. It was amazing. And they, the beautiful part about it is when you looked at the tool at the very end of the cut, it looked like it was brand new. Okay? So that's it for now. Uh, again, thank you very much for joining the uh, session. And uh, we will make a new session very, very shortly. We'll get, I'll get back to you exactly with the exact thing. Okay? Take care, everyone. And again, this Thank is you. recorded. Thank you very much. I'll send this to everybody as well. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Very good. You're yeah. very welcome. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.